Let's start with 405 Burke Street in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe this project? And Melbourne has this interesting condition of these laneways that uh, describe what those are for people that have never been to Melbourne and how your building is going to work with those when it's uh, finished because now it's under construction. Yeah, the, um, the CBD of Melbourne is a, is a perfect grid that was set up to align with the, the river um, called the Hoddle Grid and that's um, really a little bit like parts of New York set up a rhythm of streets between the major streets and the, and the, the minor ones and then it has these fantastic then north-south laneways that run along it. And 405 Burke Street sits right in the middle of that of that overall grid. Um, Elizabeth Street and Burke Street being the major, major streets. And by um, doing this development over a, it's about a 4,600 uh, 4, square metre site, it's a missing link into the sort of broader laneway context. So we did a lot of pedestrian studies to sort of show that there was um, a major sort of north-south south, um, track that went almost the whole way through the grid. So this will link up, as it's called Hardware Lane, then goes to McKillop Lane, then goes to equitable place then so it's this um, you know quite a um, highly desired and track I suppose through mm. through the city and so how does the building actually integrate with that because it's a high-rise yeah it's a tall building but how does the ground floor or the base of this building meet with that laneway system so it has a, an arcade that will run directly through it which is which is sort of off center to the um, the office lobby so the office lobby has a formality about it the laneway has a more an accessibility about it and you can come up into a second level and so the it's really blurring the lines between the public realm and the and the office realm and that's what um, a lot of tenants have liked about that sort of bringing the customer into their into their business um, but then that that sort of basically is able to plug into there's a little a really beautiful little laneway called Gills Alley and that's off to the side and the, and the end of trip facility will come through there so you can see people walking their fixies into um, in, in that way and grabbing a, a healthy breakfast and slotting into it and then um, and then off to one side is McKillop Lane which um, we think has um, the ability to be vastly improved and it'll be a food and beverage district that lines up with Hardware Lane which is one where um, people do do um, readily sort of um, align that with um, with a, a lunch environment um, mm -hmm. or after after work drinks kind of um, kind of place. And was the project conceived of so that it would have that selling point of, like you said, tenants like this idea of having all that foot traffic? Or, or were you, was it partly historic preservation? I mean, how did this come about and become part of the central part of the project? I think it was, um, I think it was really driven by what tenants really want. And that's, you know, we're, we're seeing in Melbourne for a long time, the city sort of grew outside of itself. It went, it went towards um, St Kilda Road in the 80s and South Bank in the 90s and the Docklands in the, in the noughties. And finally, it's sort of consolidating back in on itself. And the tenants are really saying that they want to be part of that finer grain mm -hmm. and part of that connectivity with, um, with the sort of 24 hour, seven day a week, um, mm -hmm. so not, not just the sort of white shirts and um, um, business um, environment. And you've done a similar thing in Wynyard Place mm -hmm. in Sydney. So tell us about that project and, and how Sydney's laneways are integrated into Wynyard Place. So yeah, um, Wynyard is um, essentially provides a, a brand new entrance into Wynyard Station. So it connects George Street through through to the station with this um, fairly grand urban room um, that we, we're sort of calling the Transit Hall. And so it'll have a very busy civic face onto George Street, about 120,000 people a day pulsing out of Wynyard Station. And the majority of those are sort of heading east onto onto George Street. And then through through the use of different uh, sort of strata, as it were, through, through the section of the building, we then have a more formal office environment that is lifted up on to Carrington Street and connects with the heritage fabric, fabric of Shell House on that side. So it's really more of a, a civic face and then a, a business face as, a, of, the, of the overall project. Mm -hmm. And this project's under construction right now? Yes, it's been going for a little bit over 12 months, so um, demolition is nearly completed. So we've gone below street level and we'll hit the um, Sydney Sandstone fairly shortly. And then from that we, st we start to launch up with um, completion in, in about middle of 2020. Another project you're working on is Elizabeth Keys in mm -hmm. Perth. That's a little earlier in the phase of yes. construction and design. Um, what's going on with Elizabeth Keys and tell us what uh, is of note of that project? Um, well, Perth really traditionally was a one street town. It had St George's Terrace and the, um, the planners in Perth have had some really good vision to, to essentially bring the Swan River, which is a beautiful context for Perth, to bring it a bit closer to the city. And they've cut an, an inlet out, spent about $450 million on infrastructure to, to deliver a, um, a waterfront precinct. Now, lots five and six are the um, uh, essentially the dress circle sites in, in that and we've um, worked with um, Rex out of uh, New York, won a design competition to do a mixed use tower that will be Perth's tallest building um, right on the water's edge, centre of Perth's postcode, um, postcard and that's going to include um, 
uh, a small amount of office, about 15,000 square metres, a 220 room um, hotel with a really um, amazing ballroom that will cantilever out the side of the building and provide really sweeping views. And then 220 condominiums above that, which we Perth's um, you know, best um, strata residences. And on, the, on lot six, which is me immediately next to that, is um, we're going to do a pure office play and that's about 30,000 square metres of office. But the two will tie together to have a retail um, presence at the, at the ground plane, to have a hotel lobby and, and, and you know, um, residential entrance and office, meaning that it'll be, again, it'll be sort of busy, um, busy around the clock and, and, and through the whole week. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting in Sydney and other cities where you have multiple dense areas and nodes of the city that are you know, not just one singular downtown. Yeah. Um, how do you, do you think that that's a, a positive trend? Are there things that need to be managed? Um, how do we keep Sydney affordable while this development keeps booming all over town? Um, I think the first thing is um, around Sydney is, is very much a polycentric city and that's really based on the harbour and, and Pittwater um, and Botany Bay produce a whole lot of um, peninsulas. So yeah. Sydney siders generally do set, tend to stick to their patch a little bit and um, because it's such a sprawling footprint, you know, as big as London but, you know, sort of one, um, one fifth of the density, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've started to see the necessity to get these um, other business districts going and so... Um, and they, you know, now North Sydney, Macquarie Park, um, Chatswood, um, Parramatta, they're all viable secondary office markets. And I think the mm -hmm. Greater Sydney Commission are doing a great job to sort of really talk about the 30-minute city so we don't have a dormitory suburb in the in the west, very, you know, western fringe, travelling all the way to the eastern fringe yeah. you know, to work every day and, and back again. So um, I think it's to be embraced, and particularly Parramatta, because that's, that's really geographically in the centre of the overall Sydney footprint. Mm -hmm. Whereas you look at Melbourne, Melbourne and um, Melbourne is very much a radial city. The, city. the CBD is in the middle and pretty much everyone comes in and goes out. The office markets aren't vastly different in terms of scale, but they, um, it's certainly um, there's no real viable secondary market that, yeah. that works in Melbourne. How do those develop? I mean, you can't just put a tall building and then have a mm. CBD develop around it, but also you kind of have to have momentum before the land values go up enough to justify a tall building. Mm. So should planners be develop be encouraging new CBDs? How does that work, or is it best left up to the private market? Um, at the moment, there's a lot of work going to that with the um, federal government sort of through all layers of government, and I think that they're doing a much better job to sort of say, okay, I think these things will start by major pieces of infrastructure. So Macquarie Park was started by Macquarie University being being built there, and but it took you know 30, 40 years for for the biotech to sort of follow in behind that, and then eventually a train station, and um, so it needs to be far more coordinated to try and get these things um, more within proximity of each other time wise. Um, so I mean, Parramatta is and it has always been a city, but for a while it was it was cut off. I mean, the major road links were, were, were broken, and um, and it's, it's still not not at all easy to drive out there. So um, Parramatta will have a new in time a metro rail, um, fast rail, which will, will probably make a big difference. And a second airport being built out at Badgerys Creek will will feed into Parramatta and the Penrith sort of western market pretty hmm. significantly. Hmm. There's a huge problem with affordability in Sydney. Mm -hmm. It's Growing very fast, uh, you mentioned it's one fifth the density of London, but it's still a dense place, mm. and a lot of areas are getting unaffordable. This is a similar story to have uh, cities that it's happening around the world. Mm. How do we keep? The city is affordable, and how do we keep Sydney affordable? Um, I think that it has to be attacked on multiple levels. I think it's, you know, at its, at its core, it's a supply demand thing. And in Sydney, we have strong inward migration. We have, um, and our ability to, to, to turn on new housing development has been slow, it's sort of blocked in a planning sense. We have um, a very high cost of construction in Australia and fairly low productivity. I think that's a factor. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a tax system that sort of um, probably um, benefits a particular sort of segment in that market. Market and to the exclusion of therefore probably making a, um, a, a, um, a build to rent model work w within mm. Sydney. So I think that that diversity of product is, is key. Mm. But I think, um, and then we probably have to look at more of, um, you know, the housing model. I think, you know, we've sort of traditionally had large um, freestanding suburban houses. And I think that that's sort of, um, for many people going forward, that probably isn't going to suit in terms of where that would be geographically located and just how much that's, that really does cost to, to produce in an infrastructure. Mm sense. So what's the developer's role in all that? 
Um, I think the developer's role is to try and meet the market always, you know, in trying to produce a, um, a product that, that people will, will want to buy and want to, want to live in. But I think that, um, you know, the developer really should be looking towards um, trying to get that speed to market working as much as possible and, and working with the layers of government to say that, you know, density done well in the right areas is really the answer. So, so the metro that I mentioned before um, to, out to um, Western Sydney, yeah. that has the potential of producing really four cities within Sydney, you know, and it could be the, the base precinct um, uh, out at Homebush, which already exists, but could be supercharged. Um, and then um, there's other, other sort of parts along that line, which, which could go really well by having a, um, a, a metro station sort of plugged into an existing sort of um, pocket of density. That's the Metro West plan? Yeah, it's not yet committed, but it's, um, it looks highly likely that it will get up and its impact will be enormous, I think. So you're saying sort of more density along transit Yes. Nodes will encourage affordability, or shouldn't there? There has to be something done to make sure that that it stays affordable and doesn't just go for however much it's worth. I mean, how do you? How do you? Oh, look, I'm, I'm a gen general believer that the market should should deliver affordability. I think most interventions into the market, you know, where we look at sort of rent controlled product or or um, you know, I think I think key worker housing is another story, but that's hmm. sort of part of it where I think we do really need to focus on. Areas like you know where, where you definitely need those sort of critical services, but people will never be able to afford to, to live in some of the more um, affluent areas of Sydney. You do need to in intervene into it. But the other part of that is really just being able to produce more stock yeah. um, and more stock so that um, you know it puts it not necessarily like huge amounts of downward pressure on it, but it's something that the right. next the next um, uh, generation can kind of get a foot on and then get in and sort of move their way up from there. What's the main reason that Sydney's not producing enough stock fast enough? Um, it's the planning system's probably been the key constraint, so that um, speed to market, particularly for land releases, has been really very difficult. Um, I'm no expert in that, but I know that being able to produce that sort of greenfield development is incredibly slow. Um, and then resistance to density within, you know, non-typical um, sort of CBD areas. Um, so that, you know, if we're looking to um, plug additional density through the inner western sort of rail corridor and stuff like that, mm -hmm. there will be a lot of pushback on that. And what do you do with that pushback? As a developer, how do you address it? People that are wary of new density in, in their neighborhood. Um, I think it's about communication with stakeholders so that it's really about, I th you know, you really have to focus on public benefits. So, you know, being able to produce, um, the, the, the government can't in, within themselves continue to always produce all of the um, public amenities. So as developers, we, you know, we need to be able to um, we need to be able to produce and deliver to the market those public open spaces that will be delivered by the private sector or, or um, community buildings or you know schools or you know what, whatever are the additional things that the community will see that additional density really brings along. So as a, an example in um, um, out in Homebush at um, you know where the developers got together and produced a new bridge link that sort of that took people um, a much more accessible way of getting across to roads and that, and that opened up um, additional density but people sort of in the wider community could accommodate that because it was amenity for everybody. Mm -hmm.